Hello, my name is Kendra Winchester. Welcome back to my channel. And today I thought I would talk to you all about uh, my probably my top 10 favorite books-ish. Uh, they're pretty close. I went through my library and picked out 10 books that I would want to reread and base my favorites on that. And these are in no particular order. Now, many of you who have been watching for a long time can probably guess all of these, or at least some of them. Uh, so let's play a game. Once you pause the video, take a piece of paper and a pen, write 10 items, and just write out the books that you think that I will mention today as some of my favorite books of all time. And I've picked a selection, both recent reads and older reads, so we'll see what happens, but I'm really interested to see uh, what you think are my favorites. If you are new here, welcome! You will learn my favorites today, and you'll get to know me, I can get to know you in the comments, it'll be a great day. All right, so these are gonna be in no particular order, I actually just stack them here, so we're just gonna start uh, from the top of the stack and just move our way down, all right? Okay, first up, I can't get it out of the box, but uh, first up is Sabriel by Garth Nix. Uh, this is one of my favorite fantasy books of all time. Garth Nix is an Australian writer, and he wrote the Aberson Trilogy, which is this trilogy. You can see it here. Uh, my favorite is Sabriel, and so it is the first one here. And the audiobook is actually read by Tim Curry, and it is an amazing audiobook that I have reread multiple times. Um, I just love this series. It's so imaginative. It's about a girl in this like early 19 teens kind of era uh, in this, you know, fictional universe. And across the wall is like a medieval kingdom. And her dad is the Alberson. He is the guy who keeps the dead down. He battles necromancers and keeps the dead from uh, coming out of these like spiritual centers, locations, and uh, eating people. Pretty cool, right? Yeah, I really love it. And my dad is finally reading this for the first time just now. I mean, it only took like 15 years, but that's fine. <laughs> we made progress. Okay, second up, staying in the same vein, um, I really love Tamara Pierce. And I picked Alana the Lioness because it is uh, her first book in the Tortal universe, but if you picked Tortal universe or really any books in this series, I think it totally counts uh, because I love uh, pretty much all things uh, in this. I loved Alana. This is the first adventure. This is her first book and she is a girl who wants to become a lady knight. So she and her brother switch places and she is uh, running around as a boy, Alan, and trying to become a knight. Pretty cool. Um, huge fan. And I actually read a book about Alana's daughter first before I picked up the series, but I just love them all. And also Sabriel by Garth Nix and uh, this series have some amazing cat characters in them. Highly recommend. Moving out of the fantasy sphere, um, it wouldn't be a video about Kendra's favorite books without Salvage the Bones by Jasmine Ward. I just love Jasmine Ward. She is absolutely phenomenal. And this book has some of the most lyrical, gorgeous writing that I have read in the last decade. The audiobook is phenomenal. Uh, this book is about Esh, and she is a young girl uh, living in the Mississippi Delta, and Katrina is on its way. And uh, her brother's a dog, Pitbull, has just given puppies. That's why she's on the cover. And there are themes of motherhood. There's also like a Greek mythology woven into this story. And Jasmine Ward has just done an amazing thing with this book. And uh, this is actually part of a trilogy that's set in the same neighborhood. Uh, Sing and Buried Sing is the third one. This is the second one. And the first one is Where the Lion Bleeds, which was recently reissued, I believe, by Scribner. Um, this is out from Bloomsbury. So I, I love her. She's amazing. Just fabulous. One of the most recent books added to my mental like favorites list is Junpa Lahiri's The Namesake. And uh, I absolutely love this book and I can't stop thinking about it. And I read it, what, six months ago? Uh, this book is Junpa Lahiri's debut novel. And it is about a young boy named Goggle. He is an Indian American. His parents are immigrants from India and his they have a pet name which is like your household name which is Goggle it's a, it's a Russian author and they were gonna give him an Indian like official legal name but in America it didn't 
work the same as it does in India, and through a confusion of events, his name is Gogol. So it's kind of a symbol of his identity crisis that he has being Indian American and trying to fit somewhere, but feeling like you fit nowhere. Gorgeous book. Gorgeous book. Next up is Gilead by Marilyn Robinson. Uh, Marilyn Robinson is a brilliant writer. Uh, she is a Congregationalist, which is a denomination of Protestant Christianity, and she is just brilliant. And I read an article that said that she sometimes fills the pulpit when her pastor is gone, and just seeing a woman in spiritual leadership is just very important to me, but also seeing an amazing, talented writer write about religion in such a nuanced way is also very important to me. And so when I read this book, I found that uh, the main character, John Ames, he's an older man, he knows he's going to die, and he's writing a letter to his young son. He and his, his wife is much younger than him, and so they had a son um, when he was basically old enough to be this kid's grandfather, um, but he knows he's going to pass away before his son becomes a man, and so he writes this letter. And this is actually the first in a trilogy. Uh, the second one is called Home, and it's about a lot of the similar events that happened in this book, only from a different character's perspective. And the last book is called Lila, and it's from John Ames' wife's perspective and how she came to be with John Ames. And I think they all three need to be read together and they create a thematic whole to, so, to get Marilyn Robinson's total perspective on the world and life. I, I think you have to read all of them. It's almost like um, The Call of the Wild and White Fang. Like they need to be read together to get the thematic whole of what Jack London is trying to say. I feel very similar about this trilogy, uh, but the way that she writes a nuanced religious leader's character's perspective I find fascinating and is personally very meaningful to me. Love it so much. But when I was getting married, I was getting married uh, the day after graduation because I wanted all my college friends to be able to attend since neither my husband nor I are from the area where we got married. And so uh, I wanted to go see this author and have this book signed, but it was like a month before I got married and I didn't have time because I had finals. <laughs> so I was so sad I missed it. And so what my mom did was she actually went online found a signed first edition of The Ocean at the End of the Lane by Neil Gaiman. Neil Gaiman is very important to me because I love fantasy, but also because he's very passionate about making audiobooks accessible, but also well-crafted. He does a lot of full-cast audiobooks, which just means that when uh, a character is speaking, that dialogue is spoken by a different actor, and then there's a single narrator uh, just reading the general text. And I really love what he's done. Um, he also has an amazing voice. I want to marry his voice. It is, oh, it's fabulous. And he reads his own audiobooks and then, then typically he comes around again and does a full cast audio edition. It's brilliant. I, I love what he does with audio, how he's embraced that medium. And that is important to me as someone with migraines and he uses audio, well, currently I use it exclusively to read. Like I can't read print right now. So this is one of my favorite, this is my favorite books of his. He's one of my favorite fantasy authors and what this means for him and his relationship with his wife Amanda. I mean this book is to Amanda and the dedication um, says for Amanda who wanted to know and I think that really exemplifies a really turning point in his career in his writing. Yeah. A book that I have not stopped thinking about since I read it in, in a short story collection that really for me personally is everything that a Kendra book I really want it to be. So it has all my favorite themes and settings and tropes. The style of the writing is a very uh, my style, beautiful, and you, when read out loud it sounds gorgeous. Um, and it's kind of loosely fairy tale inspired, but also there's a lot of American folklore wrapped around these stories. And that is All the Names These for God by Anjali Sachdeva. Uh, this won our Reading Man Award for Fiction in 2018. And we love this book because of what she did with each of the stories. They're all so different, they're all so vibrant, each is unique, but yet they still go around the theme of characters trying to come to terms with circumstances beyond their control or things that they are obsessed with, um, but it's, it's this lack of control in their own lives that is emphasized in this book. And I found that this book is just incredibly moving and, and when read out loud, it's very lyrical. And I read some of these stories in print and I read some of them via audio and either way, beautiful. 
and for me a short story collection each one needs to stand out i don't really like filler stories at all honestly um so when i read this one each story moved the reader to a new place in this concept but also they move through time they move through genre they move through realism to fantastical the structure is gorgeous like everything that she did with this book is is beautiful. So one of my favorite books ever um, that I have read in, in my life, and obviously it's on this list, but also an author who is fantastic, who's quickly become one of my favorite authors of all time, um, is this one, uh, Pachinko by Min Jin Lee. Autumn and I met uh, Min Jin Lee about a year ago. She came to South Carolina and we met her, took a photo with her, and she opened up her binder and she said, look, I have my Reading Woman Award sticker right here next to my National Book Award finalist sticker. And we are under no delusions that we are as awesome as the National Book Award, but the fact that she understood how much it meant to us that she'd written this book and, and that how much we loved it, and she put that sticker in her binder, and she's a very gracious person. And I was just so moved by how kind she has been uh, throughout this whole process. We interviewed her and we just came back to her book again and again about how wonderful it was. And this this was the winner. Um, Autumn and I have never had to argue about who wins a book, honestly. Like we both go on this process trying to go with open minds, but this book always was special. To us um, and I find it very unique and after we read this book um, after she I think pretty sure after she won we found out that Min Jin Lee is Presbyterian and that a lot of that influenced the way that she wrote um, this book and this book is about a, a population of Korean people who moved to Japan during the, the Japanese occupation of Korea they moved to Japan and they are still there currently to this day but they're not allowed to be citizens for various reasons and so she profiles them in this book it's fabulous. Don't take our word for it. It's won lots of awards and different things and it's gorgeous and I cannot wait for the third, bo third book in her thematic trilogy with this. Uh, she's just gorgeous. Okay, two more. So we have, uh, next up is a book that I read um, at college and when I read it I was blown away and I have not stopped thinking about it and it just taught me so much about what literature can be. Um, and that is Mama Day by Gloria Naylor. Uh, this is an amazing book. Um, at the time, I was a very poor <laughs> grad student, so I was borrowing all these books in the library, and so I went back years later, and we went to this used bookstore, and I found this original hardback edition. Now, it is not a first edition, but it's this original hardback edition, and um, so that's why it's in plastic. Um, but I treasure it because it's important to me. Not necessarily that it's actually worth a lot of money, but... Um, it's such an amazing book and this book is about a young woman who grows up on a fictional island between South Carolina and Georgia and uh, both South Carolina and Georgia think this island belongs to the other state and so no one really knows they exist and it's sort of like this magical island uh, where uh, there are no white people um, it was a former plantation and then it was just given over to the African-American people and they took it over and have had community there and there's a lot of magical realism in here. I mean, if you've read Zora Neale Hurston, you can tell this is in a similar vein. Um, or if you've read... Hi, baby. Hi, how are you? You want to be part of the video? Is that what you want to do? You licking me? You happy? You want to sit in my lap? No. You want to go play with your toys? Go play with your toys. So anyway, um, this is a gorgeous book. So it's the same vein as, like I said, Zora Lee Hurston or Toni Morrison uh, or Desmond Ward. You can see uh, there's a lot of traditions. And I know we use the term magical realism, but a lot of different writers from the African diaspora have mentioned that this is not magical realism to their culture. So uh, people like Way Too Moore are talking about how this is just how stories are told, um, where she is from. And, and I think that's something important that we need to remember when we look at a lot of these stories that are from African Americans and, and take that into consideration when we look at this, uh, these types of stories with fantastical elements. What are they really? What does it mean for the writing? What traditions do they come from? And I think this is one, a book definitely part of that conversation. Okay, so this book, next book, I feel represents part of me, uh, the nature-loving part of me. 
Um, and I read this book in the summer of 2016 when it came out. And this book is not perfect. It, it kind of, it's unruly. It's uh, messy. There are part of the elements that, you know, I kind of wonder about. And I think that you have to take some of the representation with a grain of salt there. But um, Barkskins by Annie Prue has a very affectionate place in my heart. I don't love it because I think it's perfect. I love it because it personally meant a lot to read it when I did and how I was able to just relax and set aside a lot of my other reading and just read this book. Um, it's very long. For a very long time. Um, I really love multi-generational family sagas. This is what it is. It's also I'm very into nature and preservation and understanding the world around me and I think that that she communicated that in this book and I think that she also illustrated how oftentimes um, d destruction of land follows colonialism pretty closely and she just tackles so many things. Also I admire Annie Prue because she wrote this book when she was in her 80s. I want to be writing books like this when I'm in my 80s. <laughs> like, that's phenomenal. So for me personally, I think this definitely represents a type of book that may not be a perfect book um, to other people, but and I don't think it's perfect, but it's a one that's important to me and is a favorite to me. And I think we all have books like that. And so while I acknowledge that this book does have issues, I personally love it. All right, so that's it for me. Uh, tell me in the comments how many out of 10 that you got correctly. Uh, thank you for watching and I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.